Good evening, everyone. My name is Elizabeth, the Education Coordinator for Marlene's Market in Delhi. Tonight's special guest that we have with us is Dr. Timothy Sobe. He is a local physical therapist and has much expertise in the field. We are always so thrilled to work with him. Thank you so much, Dr. Sobe, for being here. Oh, you're quite welcome. Happy to be here. Virtual. Mm -hmm. Yes, virtually. Yeah. And that's what's so great about this platform. Um, and um, thank you for uh, uh, joining us while you're um, out of state and um, uh, having this time for us. We super appreciate you. Mm -hmm. And uh, you have a really important topic to share with us tonight. Moving your brain beyond pain, the neuroscience of chronic pain. Very good. Thank you. Well, welcome everyone. Um, I wanted to go ahead and take inventory of, of the audience. I see various names and microphones muted. Uh, there are There is a chat section for those of you familiar with Zoom and you're, you're welcome to enter something into the chat button. But I'm curious as to what conditions or situations brought you here today on a Thursday evening and some information about the presenter for an appointment or contact information will, is available that's being posted from Elizabeth now. Thank you, Elizabeth. So often there's persons with orthopedic related pain, low back uh, pain being the, the biggest um, source it seems, uh, followed by, by headaches and cervical neck pain, musculoskeletal. And there's something interesting about how movement related orthopedic conditions become really predominant categories of chronic pain situations. So there must be some kind of correlation between pain and movement. Movement is a function of protection and expression and pain being a vital you know, part of our survival. We need pain to be able to uh, know what's potentially harmful and what isn't to distinguish and differentiate what happens in our environment. And yet our, our brain's pathways and organizational levels are really primarily arranged to be engaged with keeping us upright and oriented and exploring our environment. This current issue of Scientific American even has the title story about um, reconstructing our brain from the inside out. It's not just senses come to us. We're actively organizing and discharging exploratory impulses to bring our senses into our environment to register what's happening and orient around them. So a lot of our senses are like receptors that uh, are connecting us to our world. And that's an external world, but we have an internalized map of it. The interesting thing is the same thing can happen with pain thresholds and pain impulses. There are stimuli that maybe create something called nociception, which is uh, a signal there's some kind of tissue damage or signal of danger or threat to our survival. And that gets registered when our conscious, more conscious part of our brain determines it's a threat, the pain threshold uh, is met and we experience the experience of pain, which is an unpleasant uh, sense that causes us to withdraw from something to protect us. And we need that. But the same way that our brain can map our surrounding environment, our brain can map our emotional discharges and association with threat and danger and pain and design maps that become outputs from the brain. And so that's been the change in recent history that the pain is not necessarily something out there that comes to us we can have associations that way. Modern neuroscience is showing that, brain, that pain is something that happens from the brain in, inside out to get registered. And we all have this experience that we get injured, tissues heal, they repair themselves within maybe 48 hours to uh, a few weeks, but pain that persists for three months or into years, into one's lifetime, is, is no longer connected to the injury that's a healed, that is, is healed. There are inflammatory responses that happen that can maybe create those thresholds, but 
that's a big question. Why, why is pain still experienced when the tissues uh, are, are healed, you know, into months and years? And so that's what we'll look to maybe demonstrate a little bit today through some slides and backgrounds, and maybe even inter, inter, not interject, but inter, introduce how uh, an experience that seems uh, commonplace under the imperfect storm, shall we say, could create conditions that uh, uh, would perpetuate uh, the experience of pain from inside out. So I think what would be best to start with, and uh, let me just check the chat and see if there's any responses. And, and if you know how to use chat, just go ahead and raise a hand or put a comment. Uh, you can just say yes or no. Um, Anyone here are currently experiencing some form of uh, musculoskeletal pain involving muscles, joints, neuromuscular connections to muscles and joints? And anyone here? Okay, thank you. And does anyone here um, have a pain that maybe is non musculoskeletal related, maybe systemic um, inflammatory? autoimmune type of condition I, I've seen here as well. Um, how about something that's related like a, a cancer type of pain or visceral kind of pain? See, not, not, as, not as common in this, in this uh, informal poll. Although that does happen, that's the case when things like opioids and um, pain modulators are, are certainly necessary because there really is a true threat happening, yeah. All right. And now how many, do we have any practitioners here of any kind? Medical doctors, osteopathic doctors, uh, chiropractic, physical therapists, body workers, massage therapists, acupuncturists, psychology, hypnotherapy. Okay, looks like it's mostly clientele. Fitness trainer, thank you. Inflammatory, thank you. Okay, all right. Well, what I'd like to go ahead and introduce with is, um, uh, a research-based video uh, that's real common on YouTube called Understanding Pain, Chronic Pain in About Five Minutes and What to Do About It. It's just basically a nice overview from Australia. And as Elizabeth has advised me that I can check something that says share sound, optimize video. And let's just play this. Thanks about almost close to a million viewers on YouTube. Maybe some of you have seen this. Let's go ahead and share it and play it. And you might need to turn up your volume to register it as well. Everyone agrees that pain uh -oh. I'm going is a universal human experience. Sounds good. We now know that pain is 100% of the time produced by the brain. This includes all pain, no matter how it feels. Sharp, dull strong or mild and no matter how long you've had it. You might have had it for a few weeks or months. This is called acute pain and it's common with tissue damage, say from a back injury or ankle sprain. And generally you'll be encouraged to stay active and gradually get back to doing all your normal things including work. Or you might have had it for three months or more and this pain is generally called persistent or chronic because in this type of pain, tissue damage is not the main issue. What's less clear though, is when you're told you have chronic pain, is knowing what's best to do about it. Well, in Australia, chronic pain is a really big problem. In fact, one in five people have it. Having a brain that keeps on producing pain, even after the body tissues are restored and out of danger, is no fun. Some people say it still feels like they must have something wrong. But that's just it. Once anything dangerous is ruled out, health professionals can explain that most things in the body are healed as well as they can be by three to six months. So ongoing pain being produced by the brain is less about structural changes in the body and more about the sensitivity of the nervous system. In other words, it's more complex. So to try and figure out what's going on, you need to retrain the brain and nervous system. To do this, it's helpful to look at all the things that affect the nervous system, 
and may be contributing to your individual pain experience. What can help is to look at persistent pain from a broad perspective and by using a structured approach and a plan, it's less likely that anything important will be missed. Let's start with the medical side. Firstly, taking medication can help, but only to a limited extent. It is the more active approaches that are necessary to retrain the brain. So using medications to get going is okay, and then mostly they can be tapered and ceased. Some people also think surgery might be the answer, but when it comes to a complex problem like chronic pain, surgery may not be helpful. So if you're thinking of surgery, it's best to get a second opinion and remember to consider all the things. Next, it is helpful to consider how your thoughts and emotions are affecting your nervous system. Pain really impacts on people's lives and this can have a big effect on your mood and stress levels. All those thoughts and beliefs are brain impulses too, but you can learn ways to reduce stress and wind down the nervous system. This helps with emotional well-being and can reduce pain as well. The third area to consider is the role of diet and lifestyle. Now it turns out that our modern lifestyle might not be so good for us. In fact, what we eat and how we live may really be contributing to a sensitized nervous system. Looking at all the things like smoking, nutrition, alcohol and activity levels and seeing if there are any issues is a good beginning and these things can go on your plan. Then there's often enormous value in exploring the deeper meaning of pain and the surrounding personal story by stepping back and looking at all the things that were happening around the time the pain developed, many people with pain can make useful links between a worrying period of life and a worsening pain picture. For many, recognising deeper emotions can be part of the healing process. Last, but by no means least, is physical activity and function. From the brain's perspective, getting moving at comfortable levels without fear and where the brain does not protect by pain is best and you'll gradually restore your body's tissues. So to sum up pain, it comes from the brain and it can be retrained. And when looked at from a whole person or broad perspective, gives you a lot of opportunities to begin. So get a helping hand if you need it, set a goal and begin. All right, thanks mate. From Australia. And Australia is, you know, the, the culture and academics there. Very, very excellent research group. Okay, stop sharing. Here I am. I'm back on the screen. All right. Um, so, oh no, YouTube, are you going to go ahead and uh, add something new for the next? Let's uh, say that it would take you 10 minutes. To let me go ahead and stop the YouTube for How a moment. Would it take if you received constant electric shocks to your hand? Oh, look at that. That's perfect. Yeah, get constant electric shocks to your hand. It's the next uh, default video, but uh, they're probably looking at um, some other physiology there. Okay, technology, gotta love it somewhere. Um, Elizabeth, should I turn off the share sound and optimize video clip if I go back to my regular screen now? Oh, sure. Okay. All right, so let me go ahead and do that. All right. I have my kids with us on family vacation and YouTube leads one thing to another to another. another. Some most desired thing. All right. So the um, has anyone seen that video before? If, if yes, go ahead, just drop a note in the chat. It's pretty common, but it's nice and concise. And the Australian accent gives it some, some validity in lots of ways <laughs> to help out. All right. So, all right. So um, they concluded, it says, you know, get some help if you need it. And um, that's partly why I'm here and partly why lots of practitioners are here. So I thought I'd go ahead and shift to maybe uh, some background about, about me and my practice and um, some excerpts from a slide. I, my, my, my clinic practice is physical therapy. The scope of physical therapy practice in Washington state is any physical or mental condition that impairs function. Most practice, outpatient practice, tends to kind of gravitate towards sports medicine, orthopedics, 
And when you go to attend uh, sessions there, uh, you will see something that looks very similar to one of our attendees who is a professional fitness trainer working on things like strength, endurance, stretching, range of motion, and uh, isolated compartments of muscle groups and some functionality and electrotherapeutic tools. But, uh, and then, you know, at least in the old days, it's changing now um, with orthopedic pain conditions. No one really paid attention to the brain's uh, source of perception of bodily perception and symptom perception or body perception, uh, unless there was a stroke or CPA diagnosis. Then there was a lesion in the brain somewhere and we pay attention to where that was. But really, in, in, in many ways, um, disordered information, disordered body representation, uh, amplified signaling that gets stuck in a rut uh, is very much like uh, a functional lesion in the brain and spinal cord amplifying pain symptomatology. And they kind of uh, alluded to that a little bit. Let me, uh, let me go back to my screen share again for some slides here. Um, so the practice here, uh, Alliant Physical Therapy and Integral Medicine is the practice. The integral medicine per, uh, part has to do with integral, bringing things together, what's happening inside a person. Uh, Tacoma is the main practice at 2nd and I Street by Wrights Park and Tacoma Little Theater. A gig harbor is where I reside ordinarily, and Olympia is my side practice. Um, let me go to just the idea of how much chronic pain in terms of epidemiology. Um, 116 million people with a management cost of $600 billion per year. Um, and at any given time, this moment, here and now, one third or more, one third or less, 30% of the population is in an ongoing pain state. And that's persistent pain without an apparent biological value, that is protection and withdrawal and, and adaptive movement um, that's you know, protective and uh, survival, life-saving. Uh, that's persisting beyond the usual expected healing time of greater than three to six months. And that's from 2011, but probably not a lot changed yet. Um, my research dissertation, uh, my PhD, psychology, psychophysiology, mind, body, and medicine, um, I decided to look at low back pain from a, an, a less mechanical point of view of like core muscles that are prescribed to corset the spine and protect it. We instead looked above and below the spine. And again, the, the uh, chronic low back pain, nonspecific, it's the second most common cause for disability and the number one problem for uh, physicians to consult um, that involves uh, a disability uh, related uh, actions. And um, no one really knows the cause to isolate. There's different opinions, but uh, they don't always hold out. They, and when you look at all the variables, maybe structural pathology of which medical surgical uh, excels in technology for is maybe about 15% of the cases. So a lot of these situations aren't isolated to a part, having a question of what's broken, fix it, but having a different inquiry, what's happening, can we orchestrate it? So again, a lot of things that we're seeing in the past, like, oh, you've got degenerative changes in L5, S1, we've got to get some uh, decompression hardware in there. Um, they found uh, with, with many studies and many interdisciplinary journals, are, are demonstrating there's uh, um, situations that are not consistent. A person might have a degenerative finding on the left side of their spine, but the sciatic symptoms down the leg are the right side. And uh, they don't always correlate. Uh, the findings don't correlate to where the anatomy and physiology would be. So how we organize our own experience might be just more important than um, you know, a, a perceived physical valid finding, yeah. And so the idea of core musculature being isolated and trained is, is, is still the dominant theory in practice. My study, I, I looked at the idea of what's going on above and below the core. Can we have a skeletal density perception model wherein the experimental group of patients who had chronic back pain in the, uh, the group, we, we looked at how could they perceive the pelvis, hips, and legs as areas of highest 
skeletal density in the body contrasted by inner air organs, the loose of our skull inside the um, inner air for equilibrium and a sense of orientation in space encased within the entire densest bone in the body. And by having pelvis and head interact, let the spine just do what it does in between in a way where it wasn't overemphasized as a problem area. Well, guess what? That group did better. They had less pain. They had greater functionality. They could hold things like planks and endurance positions and three, three orientational positions longer than the control group that looked at fitness-based models like core stabilization, activating abdominal muscles and the transverse abdominis lumbar multifidus specifically, but they're meant to be like segment isolators so that everything else can work better. But I don't see this happening in the animal world necessarily. And so it's beginning to fall out of favor um, as new evidence becomes known. So systems thinking is kind of the specialty. You know, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. That's systems thinking. And um, so maybe something above and below the spine can influence the spine, but it's not the spine. And I attend lots of workshops. I, in fact, presented in Belgium before the pandemic, like in 2019, October, uh, the um, interdisciplinary, the World Congress of Low Back and Pelvic Pain. Uh, I had a poster presentation there of my dissertation that you know, got some good reviews and everything. But prior to that, I attended in Los Angeles and some of the take home messages are that, you know, variation is more important than repetition and that we have a sensation of our body being amplified that has roles beyond perception of pain. And that uh, imagery seems to work better than just moving without, you know, mindless repetition with activity weights and things. And the idea of the real big one too, biopsychosocial factors, stress, our sense of self-identity, uh, those play a big role. And fear and avoidance, this might hurt, this is dangerous. Uh, this is gonna cause problems uh, um, in my work or ability to provide for my family or my ability to feel uh, engaged and connected to other people in the social realm. You know, that's a real fear to, to hobble and stoop and you're not cut and bleeding. Nobody understands um, these situations. So. And it's not a matter of putting a bandage on it necessarily and uh, seeing that the stimulus is abated through, you know, in the, in the acute stage, yes, an external application of heat or ice or a topical lidocaine patch uh, can, can do the job to um, um, modulate, uh, say, the input that's being processed neurologically. But again, when that heals, there's something else that's a, a larger model. There are at least 12 different areas of the brain that can process uh, pain um, processing. And everything from our cortex for sensory and motor to something called anterior cingulate gyrus that is kind of a, a recursive uh, sense of identity and the insula for maybe body sense and what's, what's pleasant versus what's disgusting or un unsatisfying, you know, our mood, our thalamus sensory, amygdala, sense of threat, periaqual, periaqueductal gray matter, that's the uh, base of the brain, even our reflex uh, gateway mechanisms can either shut off or amplify. So there's many levels of, uh, of potential involvement. And on functional MRI, it's possible to see where the oxygen uptake and metabolism is happening uh, during uh, experiential processes and, and they can look at brains of persons who have chronic pain versus those who do not. And the persons who uh, have a default mode network, just the baseline brain activity at rest is already on guard and over amplified and waiting for the next uh, um, uh, surge to happen that's, uh, you know, uh, impairing. So it's kind of senses, our senses, by the way, are designed to anticipate and predict our surroundings, having a knowledge of what's about to happen to protect us, to help us engage, to, to future plan. If all that's based on avoid, you know, avoidance of pain, seeking of pleasure, kind of the same networks reversed and nothing in between, there can be a default network where even the anticipation of something can 
augment the pain processing, even if nothing, no stimulus has happened yet. So the pain experience recreates itself kind of out of the blue. And we feel blue. Um, default mode network at work, not just rest. They had persons with chronic back problems in an MRI where they wouldn't, if you move in the MRI, it distorts the imaging. So they're laying still and they're watching these uh, video graphs on the left. Are uh, persons doing like manual labor kinds of tasks? And the, the brain scans on the left are persons without chronic pain. They're just watching people work and simulating, oh yeah, I can mirror image that. I would you know, bend and lift and carry da, da, da. But you can look at the brain scans on the right, there's more orange concentrations in the areas of the brain that aren't required for sense of movement or control of movement. Areas in our limbic system, sense of emotional pain, areas of protection, areas of maybe uh, over anticipation, areas of anxiety are, um, are lit up. They're not required for the movement, but they're associating pain with the imagined movement. So the brains are different. And um, there's various levels of the brain, different anatomical areas between cortices and deeper areas. And there's evidence of how uh, acute pain, you can follow persons who maybe had pain, they had studies, they followed them over time. They can see how the brain changes over time when there's a transition from acute to chronic pain. And what happens is, the neural circuitry goes from just control of movement and sensing our world to amplifying emotional centers in the limbic system and uh, um, judgment centers that are uh, uh, warning signal type centers. Uh, those become amplified. So the brain has learned maybe overprotection the same way as uh, anxiety. We need it to know and have um, um, discernment as to whether or not to approach the dark alley in a city or not. You know, that's, anxiety is a good thing to help make a, an informed decision. But if we're so anxious, we can't go anywhere, maybe agoraphobia, social anxiety, then maybe it's an extreme case. And the same thing can happen with pain signals in our, our neurological wiring. So this neural, this neural matrix of pain by Melzack and Wall, the researchers, is something that, uh, is um, uh, uh, furthermore um, um, expanded upon by Dr. Uh, Schubiner, who you'll be seeing a video from pretty soon about the emotional pathways and how um, the emotional, even, even emotional situations and traumas from our past is part of our circuitry that can be carried over to be co-associated with a new threat of a bodily injury. So it can be learned in a subconscious, involuntary way. And most problems that show up in therapy, people kind of twisted and held up and stuck. There's superimposed voluntary activities that stretch and overcome it. But it never makes sense that there's a lot of these involuntary compensation patterns. And with that, I think I'd like to go ahead and explore something uh, with that idea in mind. So, let me go ahead and uh, go, go off screen share for a moment. And let's do a little experience experiment now. So I presume most of you are probably in some kind of a dining room chair or maybe a table chair or a task chair at your desk or computer. And uh, we can just go ahead and do something right here in the, the world of sitting. So while you're sitting, and if you're not sitting, you could do this standing too, then maybe place, find a place to sit down here at a standing workstation. But if you're sitting, go ahead and just come maybe um, to the front edge of your chair, if your chair height has a, a certain dimension about it, just to share that both feet can be on the floor. So be at the front edge of your chair. And what I'd like you to do is just slowly and subtly Contract the right side of your rib cage. That'd be the space between your underarm and the top of your pelvis. Just subtly shorten yourself there and hold it. And release. It's like if someone was thinking, they tilted their head to think, huh, that's interesting, huh? 
you know, but I'd be like, real sad, I'd be like, hmm, hmm. Do it in such a way that if someone was five feet away from you, they wouldn't know if you were contracting the right side of your rib cage. So we'll contract your rib cage and just hold it there. And notice your breathing and, and release your ribs. And just not looking at the screen either. If you can close your eyes, close your eyes also, contract the right side of your rib cage. And notice, do your eyes tend to migrate somewhere? Do they migrate down and right in the direction of where you're contracting? Or do they dissociate somewhere else? Notice, notice if what I said is a possibility, but not a prescription. Let that go, just settle. If you let your breathing happen naturally, if it does, there might be a, a breath of punctuation that says, what are we doing here? What was that all about? Right, so, all right. Go ahead and do the same thing. So slowly and subtly contract the right side of your rib cage. Your eyes can be open or closed. But now add to that, just contract your right buttock, the right buttock cheek in your chair as if you had to squeeze something uh, that was like, uh, uh, like, like a peanut shell was on the chair and you wanted to crack the peanut shell or something. Uh, or maybe you just wanted to compress the peanut shell without breaking it. That'd be that subtle then, wouldn't it be? So you contract your right side of your occasion, add to that, contract your right buttock as if you wanted to weight yourself or squeeze something. If your right buttock cheek was a fist, you'd be squeezing it just enough to maybe hold on to a, a, large, um, a large insect without squishing it. That'd be that subtle, I guess. <laughs> That's never happened before, that analogy, but they come up. <laughs> All right. And just so you're co contracting those two elements, right side of ribcage and right buttock. All right. And notice, do you feel like you're scooting back in your chair or forward as you do this? Or, or do you feel it's just shortening on the right side? Okay, let that go. Let a punctuation breath happen again. And now, could you, again, the sequence, contract your right rib cage, shorten your right rib cage. Again, uh, tighten the right side of your buttock. And now add to those two, the sense of pressing your right heel into the floor. Like again, it's a subtle thing where you just wanted to maybe, um, crack a nut that was a soft nut, or maybe there was a spring, a, a kid's toy spring. If you're pressing just enough to maybe uh, decompress a kid's spring toy, like a slinky, maybe a little bit more rigid than a slinky, but like maybe a box spring on a worn out mattress. You're, you're maybe decompressing that uh, spring underneath your heel, maybe about a third or so. So you got three things happening. You can pause a moment with everything. And now invoke this sequence, this trifecta, triage, triplicate of, uh, of, of movements together. And we'll start to call this a pattern, okay? So I say pattern, it'll be mean these three things. So let's do the pattern. We'll go ahead and um, contract the right side of your ribcage. Tighten or compress your right buttock and then compress your right heel. And now just stay there a moment. I suppose you had an ergonomic desk that had deadlines and stress, uh, the job uh, on a screen, and that became a second nature anticipation of I better get this job done or I'll be fired type of a situation. Like you're like, oh, deadline. Oh, okay. In fact, I could trade the word pattern for deadline, all right? You just kind of shift into it, right? So either, either one will work. I'm sure if I see the other word deadline, you probably know how that, you know, feels like. I'm, I'm not good with deadlines. <laughs> so, all right, so go ahead and invoke the pattern or the deadline. Ribs, buttock, heel. I'd like you to stay there with that. Keep the pattern. If there's someone with you in the room, 
I'm going to invite you to approach them and maybe shake hands with them. Or if there's something you do in your space that's familiar, I'll ask you to maybe pick up an object or something. Keep this pattern and now stand up from your chair with the pattern slightly invoked. Again, it's subtle. No one else can see it if they're watching you. And just kind of walk around and see how things feel, okay? Walk around with your pattern. Let's see what it's like. Notice your arm swing as you walk. Does one arm swing a little bit different than the other? How many people feel younger and more vibrant versus older? Or slow down, uh, I agree. So now approach your uh, friend or an object or a hand to shake. There's someone to shake hands with, you can shake hands with them, or you can just grab an object or something. Let's say you're looking at your phone, you wanted to kind of dial a quick number for a contest or something, you know. I just notice how that feels uh, in yourself. And, and now come back from that and uh, you can have a seat and maybe let go of the pattern, shake it off even, if you can just shake it off and just have a seat. So notice how that was a very subtle set of actions we could easily all fall into in this modern world, right? Of you know all this kind of stuff that we're doing. Suppose, um, you know, uh, that co-occurred with some kind of a trauma, either uh, a social trauma of, a, 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 you know, a, a, a family or workplace situation, uh, even uncertainty in modern world with the economy and uh, uh, conflict and uh, pandemics and things, or, or, or uh, you had a sprained ankle or uh, uh, a back strain earlier in the day or something or earlier in the week. Um, and that all got kind of co-conditioned together in such a way that we're kind of co-contracting against ourselves and our sense of survival, I think at a very subconscious, subvoluntary level, we're more vulnerable in that situation of protected arrangements that way. So that's not something I prescribe is an isolated contractions to people. Um, that's called confinement through tension. And it's, it's a pretty common situation. In fact, if someone was in that situation and a friend came over that was excited about tennis and said, tennis anyone? And you'd be socially left out, right? It wouldn't be as easy. So let's look at something of another idea we could do just to show how maybe uh, orchestration of the body for purpose might be something that is an antidote to uh, protective patterns we could fall into. Connected action, we need to understand. So let's say you're sitting now at Marlene's Market in Delhi and uh, the ventilation is all open and the air is clear and the pandemic is uh, contained and um, you are looking around seeing so many things to see. Yes, there's, there's some of your favorite items, I know, must be there. I miss the Marlene's lunch, the, the salad bowl with the brown rice uh, and the julep uh, CMS shape. Yeah, some, when I get back, I'll be there. Okay, so you're looking around and let's say that somewhere behind you, um, a person is raving. Uh, they're saying this vegan chocolate gelato is the best. This vegan chocolate gelato is the best. They go on to read the ingredients. You sort of orient behind you. And as you orient behind you, you can have a sense of uh, turning behind you. And uh, but let's say that a month earlier, you had maybe a minor car whiplash accident situation and your neck feels, you know, uh, kind of stuck or something, right? But no problem because there are some studies that were done where people had car accidents, went to the emergency room, and they categorized, uh, you know, cervical sprain possibility for nerve damage and um, disc protrusion, seeing an X-ray, and that, uh, uh, my goodness, you become paralyzed. Let's put a collar on you, da da da. And that person went home and went to the general care. You got to go get uh, massages, adjustments, uh, physical therapy, and uh, be very very careful. You follow those people into the future. Their, uh, their outcomes aren't as good. Many of those persons transition to chronic pain. 
The other arm of that study, I believe it was done on San Diego uh, scripts. Uh, the person had the whiplash injury. It's important to, to rule out medical conditions after an accident, but the neurological signs are intact and uh, there's nothing uh, in terms of uh, lab and blood or imaging to be concerned about um, like a fracture. They're, they were shown a video that just explains the normal course of, hearing, of, of uh, healing, normal course of healing and what to expect. That group was out functioning within a week, fine, back to normal. So, and you know, the degree of injuries I think we're controlled for as well. So what we're told and what we're said to, there are many avenues in healthcare that tend to perpetuate problems more than open solutions. So let's get back to open some interesting solutions. Um, my study, by the way, was kind of a low form of virtual reality or maybe augmented reality. We had persons imagine horse hips on their body compared to human hips. We had people generate horns out of their skull to orient their head and neck. Uh, we created these scenarios where people were like robust uh, fantasy novel, uh, J.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings type creatures, right? And um, that animation of the use of self and bypassing areas that were like sources of pain created conditions where those persons, again, like I said, hurt less. We didn't look at the spine at all. We looked above and below the spine, the, the hip, pelvis, opposite head, inner ear. But let's go and take a look at something maybe augmented virtual reality in an interesting way. So this guy's still raving about the vegan chocolate gelato that's the best behind us. And we're still a bit stiff from whatever happened. We can say, oh my gosh, got to get the adjustment, got to get massage, got to get injection. Or we can simply do this. Take your right eyeball um, out of your eye socket, just in your imagination, okay? Not for real, okay? So you take your right eyeball out of your socket and you place it in your right ear. There's a space for it there. So what I just asked the person to do, Irene, is I take your right eyeball out of your socket, put it in your right ear. Thank you for displaying yourself. It helps to see people when we're doing these movements. Now, if you take your right eyeball out of your socket, I've had three eyes so far, just once is fine. That leaves a vacancy in your right eyeball, like a hollow socket. So now take your left eyeball out of your socket and place it on your right eyeball. My screen is opposite. Don't follow me as much. I think my screen shows opposite. So you have a right ear eye and a right eye eye. Your right ear eye used to be your right eyeball. Your right eye eye used to be your left eyeball. So like flounder fish, flat fish on the bottom of the sea, you've got eyes on one side of your skull, the right side. So visualize that and go take a look behind your right shoulder now with those eye eyes and see, see how far you see. Can you see the gelato guy now a little bit more? <laughs> so we just altered your perception of self and you turn further without stretching. And I can go on with uh, more and more details. Well, okay, go ahead, turn your eye, your eye eyes and your ear eye to the right again. And this time while you're there, because you place your left hand on your right shoulder. And, um, and rest that there. Now with your right hand, could you sneak that underneath your forearm to go on the front of your left shoulder? So your arms are crossed. It ends up that your left arm is in front of your right arm. And now this time as your two eye eyes, your, I'm sorry, your right eye eye, your right ear eye, turn to the right. Listen to the guy. You can both hear and listen to this right ear eye. He's reading the ingredients and uh, how the cows, wait a minute, it's vegan, how the plants are processed and everything like that, yeah. And now while you're there, imagine the right eyeball could fall out of your right ear and have your left hand turn upward to catch it. Okay, I so see you caught the eyeball in your uh, left hand palm. And now while you're there, someone else is uh, having a conversation about something else. And when I turn them out, so with your right hand on your left shoulder, slide that behind your left ear as if to tune them out. So your right hand is behind your left ear. Your left hand, which is now on the right side, is underneath your right ear. And while you're there, just scoot your left hip forward, your left buttock forward, 
as if to see behind you or further to the right. It's your scooting forward that way. And notice as you do this, do you breathe in? Or do you breathe out? Do the movement a few times, crossed arms and orientation, breathing in. And notice that chest and ribs are actually shape shifting. Breathing in tends to kind of inspire us up and down. Yeah, and then grow. And I'll let all that go and just have a seat. And I'll just notice the height of your right shoulder, maybe move your right shoulder in circles a little bit. Pause, let that be very still. Now move your left shoulder. Does one side feel more lively or more available or something? Yeah. And now if, if you were to stand up and just walk around, maybe, you want to turn left or right. That's an interesting thing. You've oriented to the right. You know, you can, you can go whichever direction you'd like. Walk around your chair, grab an object, shake your hands with someone. You could, you could lift stuff like this even. <laughs> you don't have to do that. <laughs> All right, so, so that experience is a little bit different, wasn't it? A little bit different than contracting stuff. You're orienting yourself in your environment. You're involving more parts of yourself. You're interested in vegan chocolate gelato. You're investigating your environment. You are orchestrating your body in such a way that uh, you can shape shift in the chair and move and feel alive and available. And so, you know, why? I guess that, well, that, that's that's what we look to aim for. And the Feldenkrais method is one of the methods I researched, and along with the augmented reality, and um, the whole idea of uh, orchestrating our sense of movement can create pathways that are maybe antithetical to protective pathways that immobilize us. And it's an overlooked idea, quality and arrangement of our body and movement. You know, there's a time where we took nutrition for granted before Marlene's, before other, other places, right? You know, there's, there, I grew up with TV dinners, you know, Swanson, the uh, banquet, handyman, you know, all the, uh, not heavy men, but hungry men. Yeah, I guess heavy men ate hungry men. Probably makes sense. But they were, you know, we, we, we were fed these things and uh, I still live today, it's good to know. But we took nutrition for granted, uh, a lot of uh, conventional processed foods. Now I think we're a lot more aware as a, as a society or culture. The same thing could be said for movement, quality of arrangement in our bodies, our sense of embodiment. So much of fitness industry, fixates the core into one place that's non-moving, and then you select muscle groups that are largely, what's the word, uh, cosmetic, and have names like biceps and quads and hamstrings and glutes and things. The brain doesn't think that way unless there's an anatomy test or a prescriptive technique. When we orchestrate movement, the brain's interest is in coordinating a variety of fibers from a variety of places to engage our world, to engage a task. That's bringing our intentions into action, definition of function. Anything that interferes with function is a dysfunction. And pain, in some ways, is a dysfunction. It has its purpose, but it's something that became less functionalized. It's no longer serving a purpose. It's kind of wearing us out. And, and there's evidence, too, that a lot of the gray matter of the brain uh, with chronic pain becomes less clear, less available, brain fog and uh, cognition changes that happen. And so with that, what I'd like to do is just uh, move toward uh, a couple conclusions here. I gave you some experiences. Uh, I'm gonna give you a resource uh, from my website and show how to use it as well. It'll be, a, um, uh, uh, it's called Anti-Gravitize Your Spine. It compares prescriptive ideas of keeping your body alignment on x-ray as one medical, surgical, chiropractic idea, uh, contrasting with maybe counterbalancing diaphragms in the body with new awareness. And instead of efforting, you find a place to dissipate into a state of being, mindful and physical, called neutral mid-range maximum ease where you feel like you can move in any direction with equal ease without hesitation or pre-preparation or worry or threat. It's almost a martial arts quality, but it's done laying, uh, standing, walking, then laying on your side 
and laying on your back. And I'll, I'll, I'll overview that. The other thing I want to have is a resource to take home besides uh, my audio, uh, my, my video experience that you can download um, is a, a, a proposal to go to Grand Cinema in Tacoma. That's our art house film uh, theater. Yeah, I, I love that Grand Cinema time I get back someday. That's the, the heart thing. I, I got to practice that. Elizabeth's really good at that. Um, one of my, uh, I guess, potential mentors more so, and I, I attended this workshop medical doctor named uh, Howard Schubner is in Michigan, my home state. Um, I was born in Detroit and Northwest by choice, still like a lot of Michiganders, if there's any out there. We all have a uh, common interest in what's in the Northwest uh, with less mosquitoes and black flies. It's great. That's all, all. We love the outdoors and things um, and, and cultural experiences too. But Howard Schubner uh, wrote a book called Unlearn Your Pain. And he's got a movie, a documentary that demonstrates this process. What I did with you with movement experiments, he kind of does with emotional processing experiences. There's another body of work called pain reprocessing therapy that delves into some of these feeling emotional states too. So I'm gonna go ahead and just show the movie trailer. And my next you know, area of interest is to contact um, uh, um, Grand Cinema and maybe get a sponsorship with Marlene's Market in Delhi and my practice to maybe uh, host this documentary film. It really is quite moving. Let's take a look. And I will optimize. Hey, my sound and video is already optimized. It says, is the trailer for this might hurt? Share it. Yep. Nervous. Yeah. Right. We're literally on this together. Is anybody nervous? Yeah. We're literally on this together because what we're here for is to get better. Tingling to numbness, primarily my left hand. 100 million Americans suffer from chronic pain. This illness has taken a lot out of me, out of my family. Just the worst pain that I've ever imagined in my life. He's taking all these meds and he's no better than he was. Millions of patients with pain have become opioid addicted. We have this idea that when there's pain, there's something wrong with the body. It's not always that simple. Hysterectomy, colostomy, ileostomy, but then the pain came back. The brain is powerful and can cause almost any symptom imaginable. How does our life events affect our body? That's what we're gonna go through today. It terrifies me. I can see that. I would reject the notion that everybody with chronic pain has a psychological origin. I don't expect Dr. Schubner to cure me. I call BS. It's pretty succinct <laughs> to the point. I don't know exactly what to expect. Living in fear is the perfect prescription for back pain, migraine headaches. People can retrain their brain, and that's what I'm asking you guys to do. I fought my whole life. Just tore my life apart. I'm angry and I'm sad. This treatment is not for everybody. Now I'm experiencing new symptoms, and so I'm freaking out. You're stirring things up. My shit is so stirred up. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing how something you don't even know is there has that much power over you. Okay. I think that's it. All right, so really moving, I can tell you that. Um, and so I took, I took a course with Dr. Schubner and you know, what, a, a concept he really helped uh, me to understand or at least compartmentalize or not, I don't want to compartmentalize anything, consolidate is that, um, you know, you, you go through your medical review to rule out, you know, pathology and beyond that, you look elsewhere. And when you ruled out a, a, a physiological condition, they had uh, reliable signs that were matched together, you know, the, the test with the clinical presentation and other medical intervention, you know, there's a case for that. 
but that's maybe 20%, you know, the other 80% of a lot of chronic persistent pain might be, you know, 80% or more. And he refers to these as neural circuit disorders, neural circuit disorders, meaning that uh, the representation of our world has gotten, the circuits have gotten amplified in places that are, are no longer purposeful. And we've somehow gotten misdirected in an inadvertent way. But there's way, a way out. And um, part of the way out is the pain reprocessing therapy. He does group work in a group setting and a resource from Oregon Pain, um, oh goodness, Oregon Pain Commission, Oregon Pain Guidance. I'm licensed in Oregon as well. Um, he has an excellent program that I'd be looking to do maybe a small group to work with as well. Uh, that goes through different lifestyle aspects, but also combine these with some movement experiences. And uh, so uh, we're getting kind of the end of our hour. I want to leave a little bit of time for questions as well. And um, yeah, I see some nice comments uh, here being shared. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm off screen. Am I back on screen, right? Do you see me? Yeah, yeah okay. So it was earlier, someone uh, I was on the presentation. That happens a lot. You, got, you get stuck on screen share and forget to switch back. Um, um, Elizabeth says, very valid point about emotional linking the physical pain subconscious process. For those who are told as children, it's better to be seen and not heard. That might have a subconscious uh, posture looking down at their feet. Yeah, very not good. Very good. Um, uh, I mean, the situation is not very good. I'm getting some feedback on me. I'm okay, good. Um, that, that dual situation of feeling, everybody look down for a moment. You know, how, how, how vital um, are we to overcome challenge? You know, it's not it's kind of hard, to, hard to do. And um, social presence is a body presence too. And looking the inner air too, the loops of the inner air, the horizontal one at least is angled up. We can first just see degrees, we can, we can see fine details, right? But beyond that, the chest drops as well. So yeah, there's a body pattern of anxiety, a body pattern of depression, and those are all co-associated with the experience of chronic pain. Um, so that's sort of a responding to a comment that I think is an excellent comment. Name of the website for the documentary in the chat. Yeah, I could do that. I'd also like to ask attendees here to uh, uh, feel free to, if you go to the chat, you click um, not, you can, you can click the number and just uh, say to Elizabeth, you can send this to Elizabeth, the host. Uh, you can send your email to her and she can find a way to copy the chat and I can get access to your email to send uh, more information about that. Uh, let me see if I can get something in the chat here, though, as well. Um, I'll put down my website as well, and uh, I'm going to go see about going to that for a moment. Yeah, if um, everyone is comfortable with um, sharing um, your email address from the um, registered meeting, I can have um, Dr. Sobe. Uh, send some more information um, over to you. So um, if you are not comfortable with that, please let me know now. And um, we will make sure that you're, uh, you're on, the, um, on that list not to send out. So I'm gonna check uh, Facebook Live here if there's any questions. I put your uh, website information on the live chat as well. Okay, right. That's the uh, lioncare.com that was, I think so. Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah, and um, also the uh, kind of the chicken before the egg kind of topic with chronic pain and um, anxiety and depression. Um, you know, it's like sometimes, um, you know, people say that um, they were dealing with anxiety and depression 
Uh -huh. And then that brought on the pain or vice versa. And so um, I think it's a really interesting dynamic of, um, you know, because the pain can cause depression because they're in pain and not able to do, um, you know, their, um, uh, you know, daily living um, quota, mm -hmm. so to speak. Oh, perfect. Yay. The documentary is called This Might Hurt. Armanda, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I got that. I'm going to. And um, you might be able to find that if you Google the, uh, just Google This Might Hurt uh, and um, documentary film and it'll show up. Okay. This but, Might Hurt? Yeah. I'll make sure that that's included. Oh, I see it right there. Okay. Not it yourself too, but it'd be a nice community experience. To, uh, I'll put together sometime. And yeah, then, that um, would be wonderful. Yeah. If I click my my download here. Yeah. I'm going to screen share just for a moment here too with uh, my my yeah my practice website is alliantcare.com for physical therapy, but. It shows up on this one as well. Um, with the pandemic, um, you know, I, I did some summit talks online and looking at, you know, reaching more people outside of our, the corner of I Street and um, uh, uh, North 2nd Street in Tacoma and Olympia. But the clinic practice is for modulating pain, research design, internal perception of our body. And there's my biography. my biography down here there's the practice the middle column is the uh workshops um actually that's they're not developed 100 yet in the third category our practitioners who work with people to sign on to potential anyway there's anyway. lots of programs i'm working with but the one that's available now is at the very bottom Better yet, meet me directly, get access to my virtual workshop, anti-gravitize your spine. You click it, it'll take you to sort of um, a host uh, a host uh, center that I, I post things on, that I'm learning to post things on. And uh, this is the workshop, uh, and you, uh, you, you sign your name. Your email box uh, automatically is... Um, a workshop where they give a lecture, guide people in their homes, and then they lay down on the floor and do these little experiments that compare different segments of the body from top down and bottom up, and your ability to access left versus right, and then we balance them out, and you feel uh, renewed and refreshed and enjoy summer. Mm -hmm. So I'll stop this here. So that's a little bit of a walkthrough uh, at timselby.com. And alliantcare.com, the left column goes to the clinic practice where providers of most major insurance uh, programs um, under the scope of practice, physical therapy and rehabilitation. Perfect. Dr. Sobey, I added that to the Facebook live stream as well. Great, great. Okay. Um, I, this is a real complex and broad ranging topic. I'm still learning. I'm enrolled in some more continuing education on these topics. Um, but, you know, the nice thing is there's a real broad spectrum of hope. If we're complex enough to uh, have a system that can engage our world and learn so many things, this is the turn more inward. Mm -hmm. And um, there's so much potential that's unrealized yet with uh, uh, the, the power of introspective touch and movement and perception. Definitely. Yeah, one of, one of my favorite mantras is um, perceive it, believe it, and achieve it. Wonderful. Perceive it, believe it, achieve it. Yeah, I think the perception part is a good um, start, starting place, actually. And where else to, can we engage perception besides our embodiment? Exactly. Yeah, because if you're able to see yourself doing it, you're, you're um, breaking away from some possible um, subconscious um, condition um, 
conditioning that you don't even realize that is holding yourself back. Oh, yes. yes. And yeah. And then being able to visualize yourself already doing it and and it, it makes it that much easier. Mm -hmm. There are lots of hidden involuntary habits. And, and with each session, we, we discover and uncover and substitute something more effective in the same session. It varies each time. Uh, there's other practitioners, Jennifer, Jennifer is Jennifer Yegos and Miller that are uh, in practice with me too. They're both Feldenkrais Method practitioners. Yeah. And we have biofeedback too for mind body interaction, uh, distress uh, disorders, uh, biofeedback and neurofeedback for EEG, Dr. Jerry DeVore, psychologist. So there's four practitioners in our practice. Oh, that's super neato. So it's a, a, a very um, integrative and uh, part. Yeah. Yeah. Very and cool. It's more about what what's not being that's not about what's being done to us, though. There is that part with acute intervention, but the bigger idea of what are we doing that we're not aware of that could shift in a more sustainable way. Stuff that gets done to us largely temporary. Change the quality and how and why of what we're doing. That becomes sustainable. We own it, the sense of ownership, learning. Substantiation, yeah. Oh, so there's that. I'm sorry, I think Elizabeth, you might be muted. No? Oh, um, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now, yeah. Okay. Sorry, sometimes my, my voice drops. <laughs> okay, I understand. All right. Any other Any questions? questions? Any questions, folks? Feel free to unmute yourselves and turn the chat box. Talk. That's great. You can even talk, that's true. <laughs> I think we have. I think I have. I have one question. Could you repeat that last thing that you said, Dr. Sobi? The what are we doing that we're not aware of? And, then, and you said a little bit more after that. Yeah. Um, Well, yeah, I guess the, the, uh, the nature of habits or involuntary activity is often something that we're not aware of. And um, yeah, I don't know if I can articulate, you know, we'll have a preview, which is good. This, this video will be available for a review. You can scroll to uh, one hour and um, 10 minutes into the program, or one hour and six minutes into the program, something. But what I, what I can remember, at least um, as a tangible relationship to that is, um, the how and way that we do uh, has a lot to do with uh, problems that persist. What gets done to us can have a, a nice effect to modulate uh, physiology, also maybe below our level of consciousness. But the fact that someone outside had an agenda that didn't, um, that, that can have a, a response, like a stimulus response. That's uh, an outside infinimum um, stimulus response. But ultimately the wiring of our central nervous system and why we have a brain, why we have a body is uh, to investigate and explore our surroundings, both internal, external, through movement and awareness and sensation and anticipation and matching what was expected with versus what wasn't and adopting um, what, uh, what functions better. And we have a way of spontaneously acquiring that through exposure. But if we're involved in it, it's better. There's another example of this. Let's, if I have prism glasses that deviate, uh, let's say I, I have prism glasses that are angled in such a way my, my eyes deviate, my vision deviate to the left, even though I'm looking straight ahead. If I go to reach for a phone, it's here. I'll reach for it like this and try to get it. Right? And then I learned to correct and say, okay, my vision's not matching, now I've got it, right? And that way I've matched it. But when I move, I do that. If someone's uh, moving in their environment, they can learn that. If someone's in a wheelchair and they're being pushed around and the lenses are angled, they're trying to accommodate the environment, but they're not moving their body, they can't really correct the, uh, the apprehension of things. It's an interesting experience or experiment rather. So it's just to, just to show how um, 
you know, the, the quality of how and what we do being re-examined through awareness practices that are functional and purposeful and uh, informing from within and without, um, and that it causes us to behave different as a consequence of it, and we mash it all together, that becomes something we own and take into our lives. And it's not just avoiding pain, it's understanding a certain arrangement that's co-conditioned with the production of those pain signalings. And you get alternative uh, competing pathways developed to such a degree that that pain pathway is no longer in the foreground, no longer the dominant player. And that's called neuroplasticity of pain, that the brain rewires itself with experience. But the more profound the experience and the more of personal interest the experience and the more generalizable in everyday life that experience is, the more we own it and the more we change who we are. I don't know if I answered the question or not. I can circumvent and everything. It's great, it's great that you expounded yeah. on it and I'll be yeah, able to I'll hear it here. Right. And I think all of us in this audience could go to sleep at night and expand on it just because it's so expansive, you know, so. Yes, it's very interesting, all this stuff. Uh, Norman Deutsch wrote a book called The Brain That Changes Itself. Is the is about the uh, the brain that changes itself by Norman Deutsch, Amazon, and everywhere else, I guess. That's the phenomena of neuroplasticity, but clinical applications of neuroplasticity uh, is called the brain's way of healing. And there are two chapters devoted to the Feldenkrais method that we practice in our, our clinic. New York Times bestseller from like three years ago. Oh, someone else is reading a book called Awareness on Goodreads. Yes, yeah. it's, a, it's yeah. a really good one. And then also The Body Keeps Score. Oh, yes, okay. That's trauma processing therapy. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk? Yes. Yeah, Body Keeps Score. Yeah, that's about the embodiment of trauma where I saw him speak live at a conference. And it's not about avoiding our past. It's about inability to live in the present. There's just so much occupation with potential threat in the present. I'm so jealous you got to see him live. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, it's a conference thing, yeah. And I, I, I don't know that much more beyond his work, but I do have the book. I got lots of books in there, uh, the table of contents, maybe they happen, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. But good, thanks for sharing. If there's any other books someone might have known that's been helpful, there's a, uh, there's a lot of stuff processed, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're getting on an hour and 15 minutes here now. Okay, any other questions and slides, even specific uh, conditions you, you think you might need help with? You can always contact me uh, directly, personally, or call the office. Uh, Aaron um, is our receptionist. Um, I encourage you to uh, check out the workshop online too. And um, I thank you for being here tonight. Yes, thank you, everybody. Thank you. And um, this will be here on our YouTube channel um, uh, for those of you who uh, would like to watch it again. So thank you, everybody. We appreciate you. And thank you again, Dr. Sobe. Always oh, you're welcome. inspiration. I'm gonna save the chat for oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, you can uh, you can save the chat for everybody. That would be good. Or save the chat for yourself, please. That would be great. Just send out if people wanted it. Okay, perfect. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, everyone.